Well, as we continue to worship this morning, would you turn over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. And as you do that, let me grab my iPad. We've been looking at uh, 1 Corinthians for just a little while, not too long. Depending on right time, according to a pastor. Um, and the last few weeks, Paul has been, he's been really stressing, right, the importance of, of corporate worship and, and really correcting a church that's kind of gone a little bit crazy. And uh, so this is the, the, the conclusion to chapter 14, in which I've just simply titled Final Instructions for Corporate Worship, uh, because he's wrapping this up for us. He continues to, uh, to look at this. It seems from different perspectives. He explains corporate worship. He, he addresses uh, the order in which we must do as we looked at last week. And he addresses what, you know, the importance of unbelievers that attend. And now he just simply comes and, and really these three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, he's been talking about this, uh, the importance of corporate worship, the importance placed upon instruction, the importance placed upon edification, the building up. We are to come to church and be built up. We are to be strengthened. We are to come with our understanding. And we are to use our gifts uh, in the same way, or in this, in this manner, rather. Paul has a singular focus, if you will, that uh, the followers of Jesus Christ would know who the Lord is, have conviction regarding who the Lord is, and, and follow after him, that we would know him. And so he, he gives us instruction, and I know sometimes we hear that word instruction. Uh, it has some connotations that simply say if we need instruction that we're lacking something, isn't it? If you need discipline because you're, you need it, right? Um, uh, if you need wisdom, we talked about this Saturday morning with the men's group. Just another plug there, men, Saturday morning, 7 a.m. We work through James. Uh, if we go and we're praying for wisdom, we have to acknowledge that we're lacking some wisdom, right? And so uh, coming to this final instructions, we're, we're saying, hey, we do need to be uh, instructed. There was a story of a poet named uh, Samuel Coolridge who um, was having a conversation with a gentleman who got on the topic of raising children. And he said, I think it's important that, uh, you know, that no child should, should receive any restraint instruction regarding uh, anything religious. You know, when they get a little bit older, they can make up their own mind. Doesn't that, that sounds like today, right? That's very familiar. As they get older, they can figure it out. Well, Samuel didn't respond to this right away. He just went on talking, and then later he asked the gentleman, would you like to see my garden? The man said, sure, that'd be great. So he takes him through the garden, and he goes to this one place where it's just covered in weeds, and he says, look at this. Right, in which the, the man responds and says, this isn't a garden at all. This is just weeds. To which Samuel re responded saying, well, I, I didn't want to impose on the garden and force the garden to, to become something it wasn't ready for, so I allowed the garden just to be whatever it wanted to be. Right? Very similar to children. If we don't train them and we don't receive instruction, we're, we're liable to go the way of weeds. Right? And so Paul has this understanding that we come, we should heed the instruction of what it means through corporate worship. We come together and we sing and we worship. So here's the passage, wrapping this up, beginning in verse 34 through the end of chapter 14, which is verse 40. He says, I let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly uh, earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. 
Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, now as we look to your word, I ask that your spirit be with us, that you would teach us and instruct us, that we would grow in understanding. And as always, Lord, take me out of the way, that every life and thought would be fixed upon you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, by uh, no doubt, I would imagine as reading that passage, you, you're probably thinking, uh, Paul is making some very bold statements, right? Uh, maybe you're thinking, and hey, most of this isn't politically correct, right? Especially when he comes and he, he speaks of women. It's not popular in our day. And I want to just say at the onset as we look into this, that uh, there is instruction both for men and women here. And it's very important how Paul theologically gets there. Because the peripheral reading of this, we might say Paul is just a misogynist, right? He has no respect or grace or merits. I can't believe this is in here. But as we begin to see in context, and what Paul is actually referencing, uh, he places it right in proper order. So my first point going to this is uh, verses 34 and 35. And I say instruction for corporate worship for men and women. There's a teaching here for both one by uh, direct command and one by implication. And so he is speaking really to both here. And he says, let your women keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for men to, or excuse me, women to speak in church. Now, it's important to understand this in, in context. Paul has told us in verse 33, uh, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches. Right? In all the churches, this is who God is. And so when it comes to corporate worship, Paul is reflecting upon the character and heart of, actual, right, of God. For God is not, right, this, but he is peace. And he stresses not only in verse 33, but here as well, that in all the churches, he places the word churches plural. That becomes very important for us because some of the rejection of this passage, I'm sure maybe you have heard, is to simply say, well, Paul is writing just for that church. And yet we see throughout Scripture, and, and even here he is saying, no, that's not the case. I am actually trying to get the Corinthian church in line with all the other churches. Right? There is his heartbeat. Some have said also that this is a time where they just simply jettison, and they say, well, a woman isn't to speak at all. They just take the hard line. Well, clearly that's not what Paul is saying. Paul has said, has said already in chapter uh, 11 verse 5 that there are women who have prophesied and there are women who have prayed. So Paul isn't coming at this with, with some type of, of misogynistic angle and saying, you know, men are just better. Right? Today the world would read it that way and that's not his heart at all. He simply comes and says, look, there's a problem in the Corinthian church and the women are to be silent and submissive. This is agreeable to Scripture. It doesn't mean that men have the right to, to lord over anything. Ephesians 5, where we see this circle of the husband and wife. The husband sacrificially loves his wife. He places his wife above him, ready to lay down his life. And in that context, the wife submits, submits to her husband. Now, before we go any further and we say, you know what, that's just not for me. I'm going to... I'm a, you know, a modern day person, you have to remember as a believer, Christ demonstrated both of these. It is Christ who yields to the Father's will, and it is Christ who loves sacrificially. Neither one of those positions is beneath Christ. So, coming to this position, we just can't simply say, well, Paul is misogynistic, as people would read this. That's not where he's going. He's in the context right, of corporate worship. He has told us, and we work through pastors and elders, that, that the task given to man is to preach. That's his role. That's simply what he's saying. If you go back to the creation, which Paul is going to draw from, as he says, as is in the law. What is he talking about? He's talking about the created order. See, man and women are made in the image of God. We both reflect the image of God, right? And, and just as a side note, we just want to say it, just put it out there. Uh, Paul believes in biology, doesn't he? Right? He understands there's male and female. There's no confusion there, right? He's writing this way. The Bible assumes that we would understand biology. So he's saying in the beginning, man was what? He was, God grabbed some dirt and he breathed. That's how he formed Adam. 
He's made differently. Eve was not formed from dirt. I know many of you always make that joke from dirt and spit. It wasn't dirt and spit, right? It was dirt and breath, okay? He made Eve from what? Extraction, right? He extracted a rib and he formed Eve. Both reflect the image of God. Both maintain complete dignity. But God is saying one is tasked. This role is tasked to one and not the other. So in context, Paul is saying in verse 33, this is the character of God. He references, as in the law, he's grabbing hold of the Old Testament, saying this is how God created things. If you think that's not in Paul's mind, and he's been saying this is in all the churches, look at 1 Timothy 2, 11, or, yeah, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 13. Let a woman learn to, to, excuse me, let a woman learn in silence and with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be silent. And that sounds harsh, but look what Paul's doing it. For, for this reason, Adam was formed first, then Eve. See, Paul does something wonderful in this passage. We read this and go, that sounds really harsh. But what is he doing? He said, God created things this way. You see a, a picture of Paul's theology. He says, God created Adam this way. He created Eve this way. And in the church, just as God created him this way, God wants order in the church this way. What's amazing in this passage as we read on, he says, hey, wives, if there's a question, go home and talk to your husbands. What is that? He brings the picture of the family right into this. See, going back to Ephesians 5, husbands are tasked with the responsibility to wash their wives in the word of God. See, Paul maintains all that scripture says regarding this. Husbands at home. Help your wives understand. So he has this this idea that they would come, right, or or after service. This has probably happened many times. You go home, and there's loads of questions, and then some of those questions are are statements that say, I don't know if the pastor knows what he's talking about, right? Um, Yes, some of you laugh. That's good. Some of you didn't. Oh, man. Right? So you go home to lunch, and you have your questions and say, this is, what does the Word of God say? Well, guess what? It's tasked to the husband. It doesn't mean you have all the answers, and it doesn't mean that women don't have all the answers. It doesn't mean that that men know and women don't. He's not saying any of that. He's saying if there's a question, address it that way. That is the picture of the family. And Paul puts it all right in the context of the character and heart of God. Men, you have a responsibility. Husbands, you have a responsibility. It's your responsibility to wash your wife in the Word of God. And there's an implication here that what if you're unmarried? Well, this is why he's tasked probably to, to encourage them to reach out to elders, speak to elders, question the, are the questions you have taken to elders. And I think this is, this is a wonderful, you see Paul's theology begin to unfold in the context of the character of God. God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of peace. He is organized. He is structured. It began at the very beginning of the Bible in creation. It's how he shaped and formed the family. And he shaped the church. He has given to the church apostles, right, and and prophets and teachers. He structures his church. He structures the family. Paul, within that theology, is saying, here's in the context of corporate worship how I want this to happen. So we must jettison the idea that says, well, that's, that's just for them. No, this is all the church is. We must jettison the idea that says, well, uh, you know, they can't do anything. No, clearly that's not true. We have Bible, women have Bible conferences. We have Bible, women Bible studies. Women pray. That's not true. He's talking about the context of corporate worship. So men, you are tasked with this, and you might be feeling this morning, uh, you know, I'm not prepared. I remember uh, many years ago uh, doing some premarital counseling for a young couple and explaining this responsibility to this young man. And he had this look of like, you know, this thought of, of, of uh, eyes and headlights kind of thing where he's just this never hit him. He never thought of this. And he had this moment of thinking like, there's no way I can, I don't know much about this, right? I don't know enough. So if you're feeling a little bit that way this morning, guess what? There's hope. Number one. It's, it's okay to understand if we're, if we're new in the faith or young in the faith, right? But we don't want to stay there. Well, the Lord doesn't want to keep you there. He wants you to move forward. Or two, right, you have other brothers to lean upon. You have a pastor who will walk with you and help you. You have elders who will support you. It becomes very important. So in the context of corporate worship, what do we see? He has instructions specifically for women, right? It is to not speak because this is what's happening in this church and he comes in yet and says there is a responsibility upon the men to have those answers. That's an implication. 
Paul's theology is the family functions. God designs, God creates. So his final instructions include, right, instruction for men and women. Going on from there, verses 36 and 38, I simply say there's instruction here for corporate worship for pastors and elders. There's something that your leadership, you need to know your pastor adheres to and your elders adhere to. He says, or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Paul says some very uh, eye-opening statements in these verses that pastors really need to understand. See, the pastor, the elders are commanded to teach the commandments of the Lord. They cannot teach their own views. Now, I know we work through Scripture, and we must. Uh, No one's perfect, and we don't always understand Scripture as we should. That's why we let Scripture answer Scripture, right? And that's why we have accountability, but we can't just choose whatever we want, right, and, and navigate and, and go through and say, I like this, I'm going to teach it this way. It's very popular. George Barna just put out a, a, a document, a, a letter about, not a letter, uh, his findings about, you know, this is the month of Reformation, Reformation month. You'll be hearing about that in the weeks to come. I always love emphasizing that. But he said there's another Reformation happening, and it's not good. The culture, the new Christians coming up are reforming their views in line with culture and not in line with Scripture. And and this is where we see some of it in Paul's response to it, right? He says, did this originate with you? Did Did you create this? Did you create the Word of God? Are you the one who can sit on top and say we can teach what we want and negate what we don't? You know, this has always been an ongoing problem. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8. 19 and 20 says this, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You know, it's amazing to me out of this passage, and and I'd like to build some parallels of what's, what's happening, what Paul is saying, what's happening in our culture, and where the church is going, and you begin to see it resonate big time here. So going to this idea, I think of this verse, uh, should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? You know, it's very popular for a, a big church up in Reading to have, I forget what they call it, but to go to cemeteries and, and lay on top of graves as if they can get the, the, the anointing, they say, of the, of the bones of those who have passed. But that's today. That's a very popular church that does that up in Reading. So you look at this and go, what are we missing Right? How do we get so far off the, the path? How do, we, how do we depart and end up going to cemeteries and trying to get the anointing from those who have already passed? Well, I think you kind of you take on, you take seriously uh, that the Word of God did originate with us. So what does Paul say? He comes and he, he clearly, I think in context, it's, it's meant for us to understand that his very words are the commands of the Lord. He has been telling the churches what the Old Testament says and the apostles' doctrine, right? You need to grab hold of this. And in 2 Timothy 2, 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach them also. Today we have the scriptures and yet so many people depart it. We don't even open it and read it. Right? We have church history. I love church history. We can benefit much from church history. It's not authoritative, as, as the Eastern Orthodox treat it, but it is something we can benefit from. We have uh, creeds and confessions, things that we can grab hold of, although they are not inspired, but we can under, help us understand the Word of God. And so Paul's focus is saying, look, if you're a spiritual person, if you claim to have right, some type of understanding or being spiritual, you're going to acknowledge that what Paul is writing are the very commands of the Lord. Right? In context, I think this is not an accident that he goes from, did it originate with you? Do you think it first only came to you? 
But if you think you're spiritual, you will acknowledge that what I'm saying is the commands, commandments of God. See, I think if we go down this road, it becomes a really dangerous attitude, isn't it? Well, I think we should just say whatever we want and grab a verse and say that's what it says and call it a message. You know, what happens when we go down this road? The church and people become confused. It goes right against what Paul has been stressing over and over again. You would be built up. You wouldn't walk out of the service being confused. You would be edified. 1 Timothy 4.1 now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. See, if we're going to come, how do you know the Word of God is being taught if it's not even open? They, you know, these teachings are, de- are designed to lead us away from the cross. I mean, ultimately it leads you to hell. This is why it's so serious for pastors, elders, listen to what Paul instruction. And I'll say it to you that you would keep us accountable. We cannot deviate from the word of God. It did not originate with us. You don't think for a moment that there's passages I would love to skip. because That's a tough one. Let's not preach on that. This is why one of the reasons we go through the books of the Bible, what does it do? It forces us to understand, right, the whole thought and, and what is happening. But also it forces us to preach topics that are hard. Because we have that conviction. All scripture is God breathed. It's good for us. Now I want to say just on a, on, a, on a note here that I am not saying we're perfect. Right? I mentioned to my life group, I feel like the last, I mentioned the last Tuesday night, I feel like the last few Sundays have just been really harking on the modern church and a lot of my reading lately has been in that area and so it's just been resonating and I see, of course, Paul stressing the corporate worship and us, you know, looking, well, let's make sure we're doing this and then looking at what's happening at the church in America. So I don't want to say it, I want you to think, hopefully you know me much better than that, that I'm sitting there, you know, uh, we're, we're all that in a bag of Cheetos, that's an 80s saying. But uh, that we're perfect, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying where our conviction is here. This is where we believe, this is where we resonate. Last Thursday, I had the honor of being the Stone Ridge Chapel speaker, and, and uh, I talked about living a life that wasn't divided, right? It's a very simple teaching in Matthew 6, you know, where your treasure is, there, there your heart is. And what most people fail is, is they simply want to hold on to the world and hold on to the cross. We want enough of Jesus to get out of jail, right, and, and get out of hell. But we want, to, we want our cake and eat it too. And so I challenge the kids to not treat the Bible like it's a bunch of guidelines, right, like from the Pirates of the Caribbean, the, the Pirate Code guidelines. We treat the Bible too often like it's just like it's a suggestion. And do you see the weight of Paul's words? If you are spiritual, these things are commandments. Commandments of the Lord. See, if there's counterfeit teaching, if there's doctrine of demons, as Paul says in Timothy, if we have Jesus who began uh, you know, his, his Sermon on the Mount talking about uh, false teachers, assuming false teachers, well then, you know, we know this is around us. We know false teaching is around us. We have to come and say, you know what? As a pastor and as the elders, we have to adhere to the Word of God, right? The apostles' doctrine. Paul puts his words right on the same level of Scripture. And then he says these really, this is a profound statement, but if anyone is ignorant, right, let him be ignorant. Paul does not desire, of course not, with everything we've preached through, desire that the church be ignorant. What he is saying, if you come to this passage and you say this is really a suggestion and not a commandment, he is saying if you're ignorant of that, if you don't understand that, if you don't know that, the flip side and the implication is the Lord doesn't know you. Chew on that for a moment. If faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and we trust what God's word says, and we're going to treat God's word as if it's some suggestions, we're in danger of not ever knowing the Lord. That's what he's saying. 
if you're going to come and say, you know what, I'm going to pick and choose what I like. Uh, you know, I've been told, I don't know, maybe you have in, in, uh, in these passages such as this, that, you know, you just need to, if you feel have that conviction that this is, you just need to get over some of that. I've had a pastor one time say, you know, we believe that, that, that women can preach in the pulpit, and if you think that, or they can be elders, well, I've heard this both ways, well, you just need to get over it. I'm like, well, it's, it's not about one being better than the other. It's about what the Lord's word says and his task one specifically. And Paul understands biology. He's not confused on what a man is and what a woman is. This is what it says, right? And then he has this statement, if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. That is a very profound statement. That's something that we should ask ourselves as we come to this and say, you know, is that, is that really where I am at? It doesn't mean that we know everything. He's not assuming that you know everything. He's coming and saying, are you treating the Bible as if it's a suggestion, if it's guidelines, or is it really the command of God and we're growing? Am I really seeing sanctification happen in my life? See, Paul has, I think, uh, some, some, by way of implication here, the, the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23, which says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied? In your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, who you practice lawlessness. Right? It is, it is lawlessness, all the sin that breaks. It is the sin behind all the sins. Right? It's against God's law. Remember in context, what is Paul? His theology is, this is who God is. This is the character of God. In the beginning, God created, and he's structuring the church this way, and he also has the family function this way. This is all in line with God's uh, reason and, and, and purpose for the church to be. And if you disagree with all of that, he would say, and you don't believe that these words are commands, well, maybe you don't know the Lord. That's what he's saying. Well, that's a heavy statement, isn't it? Here we see, right, fellowship, the church functioning is based on God's word. And those who reject the word, right, automatically break fellowship. Going to scripture, where have we seen this? 1 John 2, 18 and 19, where John says uh, to this church, little children in the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that none were of us. See, at some point, if we don't accept the teaching, and it's going to get harder, right? The, 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 the pot is going to be uh, boiling at some point, and our culture is going to have to make you take a stand. If you're not convicted, and convinced that this is the word of God, at some point, you're going to walk away. So that's what's inevitable. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 6. You can't have the world, and ultimately you're going to serve one or the other. There's going to be a time where we're pressured. John is writing about these Gnostics who had a better understanding and knowledge, and what did they say? We have God the Father. We don't even need Jesus. Right? Their, their progression was not even Christian, and yet they felt that they were above. They walked out. What's going to happen in America and the church today? Well, there's another woke Gnosticism that's happening. There are books written now talking about the woke church. How does the church deal with the problem of injustice and racism, right? This book, Woke Church, is written by a man named Eric Manson. He says this, uh, Christians, especially those of the Caucasian variety, must heed the urgent call to confront racism and injustice. I think that's the call of every Christian, regardless of your skin color. But he says, how shall we heed this call through a redistribution of wealth and resources? He says, the woke church has been identified as the primary beneficiary, a beneficiary of the spoils of white guilt and racial capitulation. Where there is peace, there must also be reparation, according to the political philosophy of the religious, veiled, cultural Marxist. See, what you have today is it sounds really good, right? It sounds good. We're going to identify with, we're going to fight that. Who, what Christian doesn't want to fight that? But see, all that undermines the authority of Scripture, Paul would never, nowhere, ever allow the church to be segregated. 
He has many times in this letter told us what? There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, because every person is a soul, and they're made in the image of God, and he says they need to have Christ. You have no right as a Christian to be racist. That's sin. Let's deal with it. But See, this is making its, its way into the many pulpits of America. There's also, maybe you've seen this in your social media, the idea of progressive Christianity. I've seen stuff float through and you go, what is this? It just it has the idea that Jesus is a way. Not the way, a way. If you go to progressive Christians, it's a real thing, huge following. And they have eight points in which they believe. I'll just take the first three and you get a, you get a picture of what they're about. Uh, number one, progressive Christianity, they believe that following the path of the teacher Jesus can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to God as well as an awareness and experience of not only the sacred, but the oneness and unity of life. That's their first point of who they are. Second one, affirm that the teachings of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience God, the sacredness, oneness, unity of life, and that we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom. Right, This is nothing but new age, including earth and our spiritual journey. One more. Seek and create community that is inclusive of all people, including but not limited to conventional Christians. They don't define that. Unquestioning skeptics, believers, they don't define, and agnostics, those of all races, cultures, and nationalities, those of all sexual orientation and all gender identities, those of all classes and abilities, those historically marginalized, all creature and plant life. I, I don't even know how to explain that. But see, this is popular. This is our culture, progressive Christianity. We like that idea of, of labeling and saying it has something to do with Christ. They don't acknowledge him as, as Savior, as Lord. See, all they do in the woke church, they tell you you have to do something. You have to re -re renounce yourself or, or feel this conviction or reparations or whatever it might be, but they never come back and say it's built upon a fact. That's the difference. See, Christianity is built on truth. It's built on, built on factual truth. Back in 1923, uh, J. Gresham Machen wrote a book called Christianity and Liberalism. I'd recommend it to every single one of you. Read that book. He, he goes through and he explains the differences of Christianity and liberalism, and he concludes that liberalism has nothing to do with Christianity. It's, it's, in fact, it's its own religion. See, today, all of these, the woke, they are their own religion. They have nothing to do with Christianity. They undermine the fact that Christ has come. He has lived. He has died. He rose again. They may say that, but they are denying the fact. See, Christianity is built, number one, on the indicative. It is true. And you see it in Paul's theology. He's not wavering anywhere. God first created this way. This is how the family functions. These are the commandments of the Lord. And because Christ, and we remember his, his message to the church, Jesus Christ and him crucified, because that is the indicative, because that is true, therefore listen. Right? We are redeemed right, by a Savior. This is the story. What is different from Christianity and liberalism is liberalism always tells you to do something, but it's not rooted in fact. That's why they call it critical race theory. So Paul is saying, well, this is why it must resonate in pastors, resonate in elders. If anyone is ignorant, if we don't believe, not in lip service, right? We're talking about our life. We don't believe that this is true. We're left with nothing. Machen says this. He says, the strange thing about Christianity was that it adopted an entirely different method it transformed the lives of men not by appealing to the human will, but by telling a story, not by exhortation, but by, an, by, by the narration of an event. The lives of men are transformed by a piece of news. It's true. It's God's truth. We must preach the indicative. See, a pastor and elder has, has no right to walk away or to pick and choose out of the Bible. Otherwise, we have to be uh, concerned with the idea that maybe we're, if we don't have conviction here, that maybe we, we really don't know the Lord. Maybe we're not saved. 
Maybe it's a call to come and say, you know what, Father, give me a, a right hunger for the truth of your word, that I would not uh, deviate, that my conviction here would grow, a biblical conviction. So Paul gives this instruction, right? He's, he's final instructions for the church. He's given it to men and to women, specifically to women, implications to men. He tells, really, I say as pastors and elders, if we're spiritual, if we call ourselves leaders in the church, then we must uh, admit that these are the commandments of the Lord. We don't get to pick and choose. We have to follow. And then the last point, I just say instruction as he kind of wraps it up in 39 and 40. Instruction for corporate worship for the church family, for each and every one of us. It says, therefore, here's his conclusion. Brethren, right, brothers and sisters, desire earnestly to prophesy. Do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Paul began chapter 14 by telling us, pursue love, right? Desire spiritual things. Here he concludes it. Right? He walked through all of that. He's unpacked it for us. He's, he's explained corporate worship a few different ways. He's looked at it and says, here's the heart of it. Here is the heart of everything. And he says, here's three imperatives. In the, in the indicative, right? In the fact that Jesus came, here's three things that you are to do. Number one is desire earnestly to prophesy. Or prophesy is always the proclamation. Paul's heart that you learn. Paul's desire that you are built up. That you would understand God's word. Number two, he says, do not forbid to speak with tongues. Corinth was a a lot of different nationalities floating through. If there was someone who came from another church and had a word to share and he had a different language, he said, don't forbid it if there's an interpretation. He gave us that instruction. But again, the focus, the heart, the the desire, and the passion is that you would know. Paul has told us, I'd rather speak five intelligent words and 10,000 in a tongue. The last imperative, let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things, all that we do as followers of Jesus Christ, let them be done decently and in order. The word decently characterizes a politeness in manners, a respect, and a love for our brothers and sisters, absolutely, a love for outsiders. The church demonstrates who the Lord is, right, when we assemble. Romans 13, 13 says this, Paul says, let us walk properly as in the day, not, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. He says, in all things, conduct yourself this way. Right, in the context of the passage, he's talking about corporate worship. Definitely when his church assembles, let it be a demonstration. The purpose of your spiritual gifts, edify, build up the body. Public worship must be done in the same manner. Let us build up each other as we assemble. I think it's a, it's a sad day when uh, the church in America and uh, the, the, the dangers that are coming... And again, I mentioned a lot of my reading lately has been what's happening with this critical race theory and um, things that are making the range of the pulpit that's actually undermining the gospel. On the Founders Ministry, there's a documentary, and in part of that documentary, they're talking about this thing, and there's a couple of atheists who say that, you know, if I was going to wreck the church, if I was an atheist and I hated the Lord and I wanted to wreck the church, I wouldn't go out front and throw stones at it, right, and sticks and rocks. He said, I would introduce something like this into the pulpit. Because at some point, as I expressed to you in the past, right, you're either the critical race theories, you're either an oppressor or you're oppressed. And to identify with the marginalized, which, which is where the Christian's heart beats, you can't just identify with with. Uh, you know, one person or one person of color, you can't do that. To be, uh, otherwise you're an oppressor. If you want to be the oppressed, you have, to, you have to identify with all of it. Someone's sexual orientation, whether they accept whatever it is, no matter color of skin, all of it. Otherwise you're an oppressor. And see, critical race theory already places Christianity as an oppressive religion. And, and you see the enemy at work because it, really, it is the answer to all those who are lost. And now we're going to have 
many pastors who are going to start uh, speaking of this woke church and all these things, and they're going to start championing people of different color and treating them, I think, even worse, not seeing who they are, their character, and their soul, but just using them once again. Too often in our churches, when we assemble on Sunday morning, we, we, we enjoy coming together, but God's word isn't there, the conviction isn't there. And this pressure is going to continue to grow, and I just see the, the residence in the Paul's heart, his theology. Let it be our theology. Maybe something that drives us, not out of that we're better or, or anything else, but just simply our love for Christ, that we would say, Lord, take the world. Give me Jesus. Not in part, but all of it. Let me have conviction to say, this is sin, this is wrong. Let me have a heart that breaks for the lost because there are many who are confused. Too often, I think, um, our churches come together in America and like the story of the little boy who went home and that evening he was praying after church and he thanked the Lord for a lot of fun in church, yet he said, Lord, I just wish you had been there. I think too often we just don't have time, right? Too often we can't negate or neglect God's authority. And I know this passage is a difficult passage. It's much easier to skip passages that are so blunt and, and, and especially that sound this way. But as we see the heart of our, of our Heavenly Father, this is how He created it. We sing the songs, this is my Father's world. And we're shaped in families because he is good. And we trust him that these are his commandments. And we're not going to be ignorant of them. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we know you, that we can know you. We identify so much with the psalmist, the scripture reading today, that, Father, we would know your word. That we would be revived according to your loving kindness. Revived according to your word. And your word is true. In its entirety, it is true. The psalmist says that. Jesus in his prayer says that. And let us this day say that in, in its entirety, it is true. Grow us in our conviction and our passion, Lord, our understanding. Minister to us, Lord, in a way that only you can. I pray, Lord, for our community and the pressures that are happening. Again, I pray for our uh, your pastors and the pressure they are feeling to, uh, to succumb to the critical race theory, to uh, woke church and, and uh, follow social justice and all these things that undermine the authority of who you are. Nowhere in your word do we ever see a, a, a caving or a yielding to, to sin. We see a, a dealing honestly with it at the cross. So, Father, racism is a sin. Let us deal with it injustices, the things that we see, let us deal with it. But Lord, let us be critical in our thinking and understanding that we would trust that your word is true. We would not, Lord, allow uh, other theories or things to undermine the authority and truth of your word. So we pray your Holy Spirit to instruct us and guide us. And may we be a church, Lord, every time we assemble, uh, just as Paul has told us when the, un on the unbeliever comes, whether they come to believe or not, that they would leave and say, truly, God was among those people. Father, let us please be that church where we would leave, even on Sunday lunch, and we would say the Lord is among his people, that we would understand your special presence, and that we would trust your word, and that you, or Holy Spirit, would continue to expose areas of, of sin or maybe pride or, or a justification of sin, that things that we need to lay down, Lord, work that in us. Reveal it to us. Let us have a heart to repent and turn from it. Lead us that way. Lord, we thank you once again for your truth. Bless every soul that is here this morning. Lord, may this day, your day, may we find the rest to our bodies. May we have thoughts that are, that are cast upon heaven, upon you, upon your presence. May we continue in an attitude of worship throughout this day because it is your day. Lead us that way. And Lord, in the conversations those in the community, those who are lost, lead us with wisdom. Lead us with conviction, even in moments where we don't understand. Lord, let us trust and rest. Your word is true. It is always true. It will continue to be true. 
And we pray this in the wonderful, awesome name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.